Hi guys. Well, it's old Mr. McCauley here. Um, you guys get the pleasure of reading chapter 17 with me and Charlie. She's over there scratching. Uh, because my phone died when I was at work. So you get to hang out with me at home while I read this. Sound good? <clears throat> okay, so here's what we're going to do. I am going to read chapter 17 with you guys. That's the only thing that we need to do for Monday is to read chapter 17. Hold on. Charlie, you want to say hi? Come here. Here's Charlie. <laughs> She's going to read chapter 17 with us, aren't you? Okay. All right, give Dad some room. Give me some room, killer. All right, chapter 17. Let me get rid of these glasses. It's easier to read. Jim, I said, are those the Yules sitting down yonder? Hush, said Jim. Mr. Hate Tate's test or Mr. Heck Tate's testifying. Mr. Tate had dressed for the occasion. He wore an ordinary business suit which made him look somehow like every other man. Gone were his high boots, lumber jacket, and bullet studded belt. From that moment he ceased to terrify me. He was sitting forward in the witness chair, his hands clasped between his knees. He was listening intently attentively to the circuit solicitor. The solicitor, a Mr. Gilmer, was not well known to us. He was from Abbotsville. We saw him only when court convened, and that, uh, and that rarely, for court was no special interest to Jim and me. A balding, smooth-faced man, he could have been anywhere between 40 and 60. Although his back was to us, we knew he had the slightest cast in one of, those eyes, in one of his eyes, which he used to his advantage. He seemed to be looking at a person when he was actually doing nothing of the kind. Thus he was hell on juries and witnesses. The jury, thinking themselves under close scrutiny, paid attention. So did the witnesses, thinking likewise. In your own words, Mr. Tate, Mr. Gilmore was saying. Well, said Mr. Tate, touching his glasses and speaking to his knees. I was called. Could you say it to the jury, Mr. Tate? Thank you. Who called you? Mr. Tate said. Well, I was fetched by Bob. Mr. Bob Yule yonder, one night. What night, sir? Mr. Tate said. It was the night of November 21st. I was just leaving my office to go home when, but, well, Mr. Yule came in. Very excited he was. Said to get out to his house quick that some men were to rape his girl. Did you go? Certainly. Got in the car, went out as fast as I could. And what did you find? Found her lying on the floor in the middle of the front room. One on the right as you go in. She was pretty well beat up, but I heaved her under her feet and washed her face in a bucket in the corner, and she said she was all right. I asked her who hurt her, and she said it was Tom Robinson. Judge Taylor, who had been concentrating on his fingernails, looked up as if he were expecting an objection, but Atticus was quiet. Asked her if I if it was asked her if he beat her like that, and she said yes he had. Asked her if she took advantage of if he had took advantage of her, and she said yes he did. So I went down to Mr. Robinson's house and brought him back. She identified him as the one, and so I took him in. That's all there was to it. Thank you, said Mr. Gilmer. Judge Taylor said, Any questions, Atticus? Yes, said my father. He was sitting behind his table. His chair was skewed to one side. His legs were crossed, and one arm was resting on the back of the chair. Did you call a doctor, Sheriff? Did anybody call a doctor, asked Atticus. No, sir, said Mr. Tate. <clears throat> Didn't call a doctor? Well, no, sir, repeated Mr. Tate. Why not? There was an edge to Atticus's voice. Well, I can tell you why I didn't. It wasn't necessary, Mr. Finch. She was mighty banged up. Something sure happened. It was obvious. But you didn't call a doctor. While you were there, did anybody send for one, fetch one, carry her to one? No, sir. Judge Taylor broke in. He's answered the question three times, Atticus. He didn't call a doctor. Atticus said, I just wanted to make sure, Judge, and the judge smiled. Jim's hand, which was resting on the balcony rail, tightened around it. He drew in his breast suddenly, glancing below. I saw no corresponding reaction and wondered if Jim was trying to be dramatic. Dill watched pe wa bleh, bleh, sorry, let me try it. Dill was watching peacefully, and so was Reverend Sykes beside him. What is it? I whispered, and it got terse. Shh. Sheriff. You say that she was mighty banged up. In what way? 
Well, just describe her injuries, heck. Well, she was beating around the head. There was already bruises coming on on her arms, and it all happened about 30 minutes before. How do you know? Mr. Tate grinned. Sorry, that's what they said. Anyway, she was pretty bruised up when I got there, and she had a black eye coming. Which eye? Mr. Tate blinked in his hands and ran his hands through his hair. Let's see, he said softly, and then he looked at Atticus as he considered the question childish. Can't you remember? asked Atticus. Mr. Tate pointed to an invisible person five inches in front of him and said, Her left. Wait a minute, Sheriff, said Atticus. Was it her left facing you or her left looking the same way you were? Mr. Tate said, Oh, yes, that would make it her right. It was her right eye, Mr. Finch. I remember now she was bunged up on the right side of her face. Mr. Tate blinked again, as if something had suddenly been made plain to him. And then he turned his hand and looked around at Tom Robinson, as if by instinct Tom Robinson raised his hand. Something had been made plain to Atticus, <clears throat> to Atticus also, and it brought him to his feet. Sheriff, please repeat what you said. It was a right eye, I said. No. Atticus walked to the court's reporter's desk and bent down to the furiously scribbling hand. It stopped. Flipped back the shorthand pad, and the court reporter said, Mr. French, I remember now she was bunged up on the right on that side of her face. Atticus looked up at Mr. Tate. Which side, heck? The right side, Mr. Finch, but she had more bruises. You want to hear about them? Atticus seemed to be bordering on another question, but he thought better of it and said, Yes, what were her other injuries? As Mr. Tate answered, Atticus looked at Tom Robinson as if to say something they hadn't bargained for. Her arms were bruised, and she showed me her neck. There was definite finger marks on her gullet. All around her throat? At the back of her neck? Well, I'd say they were all around, Mr. Finch. Would you? Well, yes, sir. She had a small throat. Anybody could have reached around, with, around it with. Just answer the question yes or no, please, Sheriff, said Atticus dryly, and Mr. Tate fell silent. Atticus sat down and nodded to the circuit solicitor who took his head or who shook his head at the judge who nodded to Mr. Tate who rose stiffly and stepped down from the witness stand. Below us, heads turned, feet scraped to the floor, babies were shifted to shoulders and a few children scampered out of the courtroom. The Negroes behind us whispered out or whispered softly amongst themselves. Dill was asking Reverend Sykes what it was all about, but Reverend Sykes said he didn't know. So far, things were utterly dull. Nobody had thundered. There was no arguments between opposing counsel, and there was no drama. A grave disappointment to all present, it seemed. Atticus was proceeding amiably, as if he were involved in a title dispute. With his infinite capacity for calming turbulent seas, he could make a rape case as dry as a sermon. Gone was the temper in the mind of the stale whiskey in the barnyard smells, of sleepy-eyed sullen men, of husky voices calling, in the night. Mr. Finch, they gone? Our nightmare had gone uh, had gone with the daylight. Everything would come out all right. All the spectators were as relaxed as Judge Taylor except for Jim. His mouth was twisted in a pers purposeful half grin, and his eyes happy about uh, and his eyes happy about and he said something about corroborating evidence which made me sure he was showing off. Robert E. Lee Yule and in answer to the clerk's booming voice, a little bantam cock of a man rose and strutted to the stand, the back of his neck reddening as the sound of his name. When he turned around to take the oath, we saw that his face was red as his neck. We also saw no resemblance of his namesake. A shock of wispy new washed hair stood up from his forehead. His nose was thin, pointed, and shiny. He had no chin to speak of. It seemed to be part of his creepy neck. So help me God, he crowed. Every town the size of Maycomb had families like the Yules. No economic fluctuations changed their status. People like the Yules lived as guests of the county in prosperity as well as in the depths of depression. No truant officer could keep their numerous offspring in school. No public health officer could keep them from be, uh, conge or congenital de defects various worms and diseases indigenous to filthy surroundings. Makem Yule, or Makem's Yules lived behind the town garbage dump in what was once a Negro cabin. 
The cabin's plank walls were supplemented with sheets of corrugated iron. Its roof shingled with tin cans of hammered or tin cans hammered flat, so only its gentle shape, shape suggested its original design. Square with four tiny rooms opening onto a shotgun hall, the cabin rested uneasily upon the four irregular lumps of limestone. Its windows were merely open spaces in the walls, which in the summertime were covered with greasy strips of cheesecloth to keep out the varmints that feasted on Makeup's refuse. The varmints had a lean time of it, for the Yules gave the dump a thorough uh, gleaning every day, and the fruits of their industry, those that were not eaten, made the plot of ground around the cabin look like the playhouse of an insane child. What passed for a fence was bits of tree limbs, broomsticks, and tool shafts, all tipped with rusty hammerheads, snaggletooth rake heads, shovels, axes, and grubbing, ho or grubbing hose held on but pieces of barbed wire. Enclosed by this barricade was a dirty yard containing the remains of a Model T Ford on blocks. A discarded dentist chair, an ancient ice box, plus lesser items, old shoes, worn out table radios, picture frames, and fruit jars under which scrawny orange chickens pecked hopefully. One corner of the yard, though, bewildered make them. Against the fence in a line were six chipped enamel slot jars holding brilliant red geraniums, cared for as tenderly as if they belonged to Miss Maudie Atkinson, and Miss Maudie designed to permit a geranium on her premises. People said they were Mayelliules. Nobody was quite sure how many children were on the place. Some people said six, others said nine. There was always several dirty-faced ones at the windows when anyone passed by. Nobody had occasion to stop, or nobody had occasion to pass, except at Christmas when the churches delivered baskets, and when the mayor of Maycomb asked us to please, uh, to please help the garbage collector by dumping our trees, our own trees, and trash. Atticus took us with him last Christmas when he complied, complied with the mayor's request. A dirt road ran from the highway past the dump, down to a small Negro settlement some five hundred yards beyond the Yules. It was necessary either to back out to the highway or to go the full length of the road and turn around. Most people turned around in the Negroes' front yards. In the frosty December dust, their cabins looked neat and snug with pale blue smoke rising from the chimneys and doorways glowing amber and fires inside. From the fires inside. They were delicious smells about chicken, bacon frying crisp as the twilight air. Jim and I detected squirrel cooking. But it was an old countryman like Addis to identify possum and rabbit, aromas that vanished when we rode back past the Yule residence. All the little man on the witness stand had that made him any better than the nearest neighbors was that if he scrubbed with lye soap and very hot water, his skin was white. Mr. Robert Yule, asked Mr. Gilmer. That's my name, Captain, said the witness. Mr. Gilmer's back stiffened a little, and I felt sorry for him. Perhaps I'd better explain something now. I've heard that lawyers as children, on seeing their parents in court in the heat of an argument, get the wrong idea. They think the opposing counsel to be personal enemies of their parents. They suffer agonies, and they're surprised to see them often out arm in arm with their tormentors during the first recess. This was not true of a gem and me. We acquired no traumas from watching our father win or lose. I'm sorry that I can't provide any drama in this respect. If I did, it would not be true. We could tell, however, when debate became more than acrimonious than professional. But it was this from watching lawyers other than our father. I never heard Atticus raise his voice in my life except to a deaf witness. Mr. Gilmer was doing his job as Atticus was doing his. Besides, Mr. Yule was Mr. Gilmer's witness and he had no business being rude to him of all people. Are you the father of May Yellow Yule? was the next question. Well, if I ain't, I can't do nothing about her now. Her ma's dead, was the answer. Judge Taylor stirred. He turned slowly in his swivel chair and looked benignly at the witness. Are you the father of May Yellow Yule? he asked, in a way that made laughter bellow us top earth, made the laughter below us stop suddenly. Well, yes, sir. Mr. Yule said meekly. Judge Taylor went on in tones of goodwill. This is the first time you've ever been in court. I don't recall ever seeing you here. At the witness affirmative nod, he continued. 
Well, let's get something straight. There will be no more audibly obscene speculations of any subject from anybody in this courtroom as long as I'm sitting here. Do you understand? Mr. Yule nodded, but I don't think he did. Judge Taylor sighed and said, All right, Mr. Gilmer. Thank you, sir. Mr. Yule, would you tell us in your own words what happened on the evening of November 21st, please? Jim grinned and pushed his hair back. Just in your own words was Mr. Gilmer's trademark. We often wondered who else's words Mr. Gilmer was afraid his witness might employ. Well, the night of November 21, I was coming in from the woods with a, lot of, with a load of kindling and just got to the fence when I heard Mayella screaming like a stuck hog inside the house. Here, Judge Taylor glanced sharply at the witness and must have decided his speculations devoid of evil intent. He subsided sleepily. What time was it, Mr. Yule? Just before sundown. Well, I was saying Mayella was screaming fit to beat Jesus. Another glance from the bench silenced Mr. Yule. Yes, she was screaming, said Mr. Gilmer. Mr. Yule looked confusedly at the judge. Well, Mayella was raising this holy racket, so I dropped my load and ran as fast as I could, but I couldn't run, but I couldn't, but as fast as I could, but I run into the fence. But when I got distangled, I ran up to the window and I seen Mr. Ewell's face grew scarlet. He stood up and pointed his finger at Tom Robinson. I seen that black N-word yonder rutting on my Mayella. So serene was Judge Taylor's court that he had few occasions to use his gavel, but he hammered fully five minutes. Atticus was on his feet at the bench saying something to him, and Mr. Heck Tate, as the first officer of the county, stood in the middle of the aisle, quelling the packed courtroom. Behind us, there was an angry, muffled groan from the colored people. Reverend Sykes leaned across uh, Dill and me, pulling at Jim's elbow. Mr. Jim, he said, you better take Miss Jean Louise home. Mr. Jim, you hear me? Jim turned, he said, Scout, go home. Dill, you and Scout go on home. You got to make me first, I said, remembering Atticus's blessed dictum. Jim scowled furiously at me, at me and then to Reverend Sykes. I think it's okay, Reverend. She doesn't understand it. I was mortally offended. I most certainly do. I can understand anything you can. Ah, hush. She doesn't understand, Reverend. She ain't nine yet. Reverend Sykes's black eyes were anxious. Mr. Finch, Mr. Finch, know you all here? This ain't fit for Miss Jean Louise or you boys either. Jim shook his head. You can't see us this far away. It's all right, Reverend. I knew Jim would win because I knew nothing could make him leave now. Dill Del and I were safe for a while. Atticus could see us from where he was if he looked. As Judge Taylor banged his gavel, Mr. Yule was sitting uh, smudgily in the witness chair, surveying his handiwork. With one phrase, he had turned happy picnickers into a sulky, tense, murmuring crowd, being slowly hypnotized by gavel taps, lessening in intensity until the only sound in the courtroom was a dim pink, pink, pink. The judge might have been wrapping the bench with a pencil. In possession of his court, once more, Judge Taylor leaned back on his chair, leaned back in his chair. He looked suddenly weary. His age was showing, and I thought that's what. Uh, and I thought about what Atticus had said. He and Mrs. Taylor didn't kiss much. He must have been nearly seventy. There's been a request, Judge Taylor said, that this courtroom be cleared of spectators, or at least of women and children. A request that will be denied for the time being. People generally see what they look for, and they hear what they listen for, and they have the right to subject their children to it. But I can assure you of one thing. You will receive what you see and hear in silence. Right, you will receive what you see and hear in silence, or you will leave this courtroom. But you won't leave it until the whole boiling of you come up before me on a contempt charges. Mr. Yule, you will keep your testimony within the confines of Christian English huge Christian English usage, if that is possible. Proceed, Mr. Gilmer. Mr. Yule reminded me of a deaf mute. I'm sure he had never heard the words that Judge Taylor directed at him. His mouth struggled silently with them, but their import registered on his face. Smugness faded from it, replaced by a dogged earnestness that fooled Judge Taylor not at all. As long as Mr. Yule was on the stand, the judge kept his eyes on him, as if daring him to make a false move. Mr. Gilmer and Atticus exchanged glances. 
Atticus was sitting down again. His fist rested on his cheek, and we could not see his face. Mr. Gilmer looked rather desperate. A question from Judge Taylor made him relax. Mr. Yule, did you see the defendant having sexual intercourse with your daughter? Yes, I did. The spectators were quiet, but the defendant said something. Atticus whispered to him, and Tom Robinson was silent. You say you were at the window, asked Mr. Gilmer. Yes, sir. How far was it from the ground? About three feet. Did you have a clear view of the room? Yes, sir. How did the room look? Well, it was all slung about like there was a fight. What did you do when you said, or when you saw the defendant? Well, I ran around the house to get in, but he ran out the front door just ahead of me. I saw who he was. I was too distracted about Mayella to go running after him, and I ran in the house and she was lying on the floor squalling. Then what did you do? Well, I run for Tate as quick as I could. I knowed who it was all right. Lived down yonder in that there uh, inward nest. Passed the house every day. Judge, I've asked this county for 15 years to clean out that nest down yonder. They're dangerous to live around. Besides devaluing my property. Thank you, Mr. Yule, said Mr. Gilmer hurriedly. The witness made a hasty descent from the stand and ran smack into Atticus, who had risen to question him. Judge Taylor permitted the court to laugh. Just a minute, sir, said Atticus genially. Could I ask you a question or two? Mr. Yule backed into the witness chair, settled himself, and regarded Atticus with a haughty suspicion, an expression common to the Macon County witnesses when confronted by opposing counsel. Mr. Yule, Atticus began, folks were doing a lot of running that night. Let's see. You say you ran to the house. You ran to the window. You ran inside. You ran to Mayella. You ran for Mr. Tate. Did you, during all of this running, run for a doctor? Well, no need to. I seen what happened. But there's one thing I don't understand, said Atticus. You weren't concerned with Mayella's condition? Well, I most positively was, said Mr. Yule. I seen what I seen who done it. No, I mean her physical condition. Did you not think the nature of her injuries warranted immediate medical attention? Huh? Didn't you think she said of seeing a doctor immediately? The witness said he never thought of it. He had never called a doctor on any of his in his life. <laughs> on any of his in his life. And if, it, uh, and if he had, it would have cost him $5. That's all? He asked. Not quite, said Atticus casually. Mr. Yule, you've heard or the sheriff's testimony, did you not? Well, how's that? You were in the courtroom when Mr. Heck Tate was on the stand, weren't you? You heard everything he said, didn't you? Mr. Yule considered the matter carefully and seemed to decide that the question was safe. Yes. Do you agree with his description of Mayella's injuries? How's that? Atticus looked around at Mr. Gilmer and smiled. Mr. Yule seemed determined not to give the defense the time of day. Mr. Tate testified that it was her right eye that was blackened, that she was beaten around the... Oh, yeah, said the witness. I hold with everything hate her. Tate said. You do, asked Atticus mildly. Well, I just wanted to make sure. He went to the court reporter, said something, and the reporter entertained us for a minute by reading Mr. Tate's testimony as if it were the stock market quotations. Which her left eye, which her eye, which her, which eye her left, oh yes, then make it her right. It was her right eye, Mr. Finch. I remember now she was bunged. He flipped the page. Up on that side of the face, Sheriff. Please repeat what you said. It was her right eye, I said. Thank you, Bert, said Atticus. You heard it again, Mr. Yule. Do you have anything to add to it? Do you agree with the sheriff? Well, I hold with Tate. Her eye was blackened and she was mighty beat up. The little man seemed to have forgotten his previous humiliation from the bench. It was becoming evident that he thought Atticus was an easy match. He seemed to grow ready again. His chest swelled. And once more, he was a little, uh, he was a red little rooster. I thought he burst his shirt at Atticus's next question. Mr. Yule, can you read and write? Mr. Gilmer interrupted. Objection, he said. Can't see what the witness's literacy has to do with the case. Irrelevant and immaterial. Judge Taylor was about to speak, but Atticus said, Judge, if you allow the question plus another one, you'll soon see. 
All right, let's see, said Judge Taylor. But make sure we see Atticus. Overruled. Charlie's getting worked up. Mr. Gilmer seemed as curious as the rest of us as to what bearing the state of Mr. Yule's education had on this case. I'll repeat the question, said Atticus. Can you read and write? I most positively can. Will you write your name and show us? I most positively will. How do you think I signed my relief checks? Mr. Yule was endearing himself to his fellow citizens. The whispers and chuckles below us probably had to do with what the card what a card he was. I was becoming nervous. Atticus seemed to know what he was doing, but it seemed to me that he had forgot that he was frog sticking without a light. Never, 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 on cross-examination, ask a witness, witness a question you don't already know the answer to. That was the tenet I absorbed with my baby food. Do it, and you'll often get an answer you don't want, an answer that might wreck your whole case. Atticus was reaching into the inside pocket of his coat. He drew out an envelope and then reached into his vest pocket and unclipped his fountain pen. He moved leisurely and he turned so that he was full in full view of the jury. He unscrewed the fountain pen cap and placed it gently on the table. He shook the pen a little and then handed it, handed it with the envelope to the witness. Would you write your name for us, he asked. Clearly now, so the jury could see you do it. Mr. Yule wrote on the back of the envelope and looked at us and looked up complacently to see Judge Taylor staring at him as if he were some fragment gardenia in full bloom of the witness stand. See Mr. Gilmer half sitting, half standing at his table. The jury was watching him. One man was leaning forward with his hands over the railing. What's so interesting? he asked. You're left handed, Mr. Yule, said Judge Taylor. Mr. Ju uh, Yule turned angrily to the judge and said that he didn't see what his being left-handed had to do with it, and that he was a Christ-fearing man, and Atticus Finch was taking advantage of him. Trickling lawyers, tricking lawyers like Atticus Finch, took advantage of him all the time with their tricking ways. He had told them what had happened. He had said it again and again, again and again, which he did. Nothing Atticus asked him ever after that shook his story, that he'd looked through the window, that he'd ran the N-word off, and then he ran for the sheriff. Atticus finally dismissed him. Mr. Gilmer asked him one more question. About your writing with your left hand. Are you ambidextrous, Mr. Yule? Ambidextrous means you can write with both hands. Why, well, most positively am not. I could use one hand as good as the other, one hand as good as the other. He had it glaring at the defense table. Jim seemed to be having a quiet fit. He was pounding the balcony rail softly. And once he whispered, we've got him. I didn't think so. Atticus was trying to show it seemed to me that Mr. Yule could have beaten up Mayella. That much I could follow. If her right eye was blackened and she was beaten mostly on the right side of her face, it would tend to show that a left-handed person did it. Sherlock Holmes and Jim Finch would agree. But Tom Robinson could have easily been left-handed too. Like Mr. Heck Tate, I imagined a person facing me and went through the swift uh, mental pantomime and concluded that he might have held her with his right hand and pounded her with his left. I looked down at him. His back was to us, but I could see his broad shoulders and his bull-thick neck. He could easily have done it. I thought Jim was counting his chickens. Okay, so that was chapter 17. I don't know what I did with my... Yeah, I'll just sit here like this. So, that's what we're going to do for today, this Monday, well, the 16th. Tomorrow, we'll go over the study guide and we'll read chapter 18. Remember, check your emails every single day. It's all the information is going to be on there. Add me on Google Hangouts. Um, email me if you have any questions. I'll be at the school between 9 and 12 every day that we're gone. And in case you guys need me for anything or need to call up there, talk to me. Um, what else was I going to tell you? Oh, I'm going to assume that most of you have left your uh, book at school, and that's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to email you a link that has the book online for free. As Mr. Meister said in his notice, if you don't have a computer at home and you need a computer at home, you can check out one of the Chromebooks. 
So come up there and do that tomorrow if you need to, unless you're coughing and have a fever. If you're coughing and have a fever, just stay home. It's it's not worth getting anybody sick. It's not worth spreading this virus more than it's already spreading. Spreading. I will also email you a copy of the study guide in case uh, you let that at school and you can't come up there and get it. All right. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Charlie, you want to say bye? Come here. Oh. You want to say bye to everybody, Charlie? Say bye. All right, guys. Have a good one.